Once upon a time, there lived a... What do you think I'm going to say? A king, a queen, a princess? Oh, you're mistaken. I was going to say, once upon a time, there was a piece of wood. Just a common block of firewood, one of those thick, solid logs that are put on the fire in the winter to make cold rooms cozy and warm. And so it happened that one day this piece of wood found itself in the shop of Geppetto, the wood carver. Geppetto was a good and kind man, but he was very poor and very lonely. He lived all by himself in his small workshop. Now when Geppetto put his hands on this piece of wood, he suddenly became filled with joy. He knew he must make something very special from it, not just a table leg or a doorpost, but something that he would keep for himself. He said to himself, Aha, uh -huh. I know what I shall make. A little boy, a wooden marionette who will keep me company. And I shall call him Pinocchio. So Geppetto took his tools and began to cut and shape the wood into a marionette. He carved out the forehead and the eyes, and then the nose, which was quite long and impertinent. Next he made the mouth. And no sooner was it finished than it began to laugh. <laughs> Geppetto was quite startled, and he started to carve feverishly. As soon as Pinocchio's arms were finished, he snatched off Geppetto's wig. Pinocchio! The poor old man really had to struggle with him to get it back. Then when he had completed his legs and feet, the impudent little marionette jumped out of his hands and began to run around the shop. You can't catch me! You can't catch me! Pinocchio, uh, come uh, back you here! Do you hear me? Uh, uh, let me there! Go. Let I me forgot go. you! Let me go! Oh. No, I will not let you go. Now listen to me, Pinocchio. You are my little boy. You must mind your father. And tomorrow morning, you will go to school and learn to read and write. Go to school? Then I will need a suit of clothes. I will make you a suit of clothes. And then I will need an ABC book. Pinocchio, all of my life I've wanted to be a papa. And now my dream has come true. So don't worry, my son. I will do everything for you that must be done. Geppetto put on his old coat full of darns and patches and went into the village. After a while, he came back. He no longer had his coat, but in its stead, he had a brand new ABC book. And he stayed up all night making his son a little suit, a pair of shoes, and a tiny cap with a feather in it. Well, the following morning, Pinocchio put on his suit, his shoes, and his cap, put his book under his arm and marched off to school, waving goodbye to his father, who stood in the doorway of his shop with tears of pride in his eyes. Pinocchio never even got as far as the schoolhouse, for while he was on his way, he passed a little wooden building. Outside of it was a large crowd of people. Such noise and excitement! A marionette show was going on. Pinocchio was wild with curiosity since he had never seen a marionette show but the admission price was four pennies. Of course, he didn't have four pennies, so he sold his ABC book to a rag picker for four pennies, and he went in to see the show. The marionettes on the little stage recognized Pinocchio as one of them and stopped the show to greet him with loud cheers. But the director of the company, a very frightening-looking man, came in, and when he saw what a commotion Pinocchio was causing, he picked up the little marionette and marched him out of the theater. Pinocchio was terrified and wriggled and squirmed in the man's huge hands. <laughs> Finally, he was set down, and the director said to him, What is your name? Pinocchio, sir. And who are your parents? I only have a father, sir. His name is Geppetto. He's a woodcarver, sir. Does he earn much? He earns so much, sir, that he never has a penny in his pocket. Just think. In order to buy me an ABC book for school, he had to sell the only coat he owned, all full of darns and patches. Oh, and oh, oh stop it, boy. Stop it. You're, you're breaking my heart. Here, here, take these five gold pieces and give them to your poor father. 
Hurry now before I change my mind. Uh, sold his coat. <laughs> and give him my kindest regards. Well, you can imagine with what speed Pinocchio ran toward home. But he had barely gone around the corner when he met the worst pair of scoundrels in the entire countryside. One was a sly fox who pretended to be lame, and the other was a clever cat who pretended to be blind. The sly fox said, And may I ask, what are you going to do with all that money? Hmm? First of all, I will buy a fine new coat for my father, and then I will buy an ABC book for myself. I want to go to school and study hard. <laughs> oh, Pinocchio, my boy, do you realize that you can double your gold pieces? What do you mean? Do you want a ten, a hundred, a thousand, two thousand gold pieces for your miserable five? Yes, but how? I'll explain. Just outside the city of Simple Simons, there's a field called the Field of Wonders. In this field, you dig a hole, and in the hole, you bury a gold piece. Now, after covering up the hole with earth, you water it well, and then you go to sleep. During the night... The gold pieces sprout, and they grow, and they blossom. And next morning, you find a beautiful tree loaded with gold pieces. You mean, if I bury my five gold pieces, I shall have how many? At least 2,500 sparkling gold pieces. Let's go! I'm with you! Oh, what are we waiting for? So... Forgetting his father, the new coat, the ABC book, and all his good resolutions, Pinocchio went off with the sly fox and the clever cat. When they arrived at the city of Simple Simons, they went to a lonely field. The sly fox and the clever cat helped Pinocchio dig a hole and bury his five gold pieces. The sly fox said, uh, no, uh, go to that nearby brook, Pinocchio. And bring back a pail of water and sprinkle it over this spot. Pinocchio ran to get the water. And the minute he was out of sight, the sly fox and the clever cat dug up the five gold pieces, smoothed over the place as though nothing had been touched, and off they ran. When Pinocchio returned, he was surprised to find them gone. But he watered the spot and then sat down to wait and see his gold coins grow. But soon darkness came and it began to rain. There was thunder and lightning, and poor Pinocchio was drenched to the bone, or perhaps I should say, to the wood. But he wouldn't leave the spot. He stayed watching all night with the rain pelting him. Soon he began to sneeze and cough, and finally he fell into a feverish sleep. When he awoke, he was no longer in the muddy field of wonders. He was lying in a clean white bed in a lovely room with mother-of-pearl walls. Hovering over him was a beautiful fairy with blue hair. She was stroking his burning forehead, and when she saw his eyes open, she gave him a glass of water with some white powder in it. Drink this, dear, and soon you'll be up and well. That's medicine, isn't it? I won't drink that bitter medicine. I won't. I won't. But, Pinocchio, you're a very sick boy. I don't care. You can't make me drink it. Pinocchio, I want to ask you something. Why were you asleep in the field? I was sleepy. Did you bury some gold pieces there, as foolish people sometimes do? No, of course not. What did you bury there? Some bean pods. As Pinocchio told one lie after another... His nose began to grow. One inch longer for every lie he told, until it was so long he could not even turn around. <laughs> oh, Pinocchio, how funny you look. Why do you laugh? I'm laughing at your lies. What lies? Ah, look, Pinocchio, your nose grows even longer. Good fairy, please help me. My nose is two feet long. What must I do? You must tell her the truth. And then you must take your medicine. I will, I will. Give it to me. Pinocchio swallowed his medicine as fast as he could. And then he told his good fairy everything that had happened to him and apologized for lying to her too. And now as he spoke, his nose grew smaller and smaller until it was its normal size. 
the medicine had made him all well, and Pinocchio was ready to return to his father, Geppetto, who was so worried about him. So he kissed his good fairy goodbye and promised her he would go straight home. As he ran through the meadow, he said to himself, I've been so stupid and so stubborn. I always want my own way, and I don't listen to those who love me. But from now on, I'll be different. I'm going to be the most obedient boy in the world. I'm going to go to school and study hard and make my dear father proud of me. Well, as you see, quite a change had come over Pinocchio. But as he came closer to his village, he saw a boy lying at the foot of a haystack. The boy's name was Lampwick. He was the laziest boy in school and the biggest mischief maker. As Pinocchio ran by, Lampwick stopped him and invited him to go on a trip with him that night to the land of toys. He promised Pinocchio that he would never regret it because in the land of toys there were no such things as schools, no teachers, no books and no work to do. He said the days would be spent in fun and enjoyment and there would never be anyone telling them what to do and what not to do. Oh, poor Pinocchio, how tempted he was. Then, when Lampwick assured him that they would eat nothing but ice cream and cake and cookies and candy, Pinocchio forgot all about Geppetto and the good fairy and all his good intentions and he told Lampwick he would go with him to the land of toys. It wasn't long until a wagon driven by 12 donkeys came along. It was filled with boys of all shapes and sizes, and the driver was a fat little man, as round and shiny as a ball of butter. Pinocchio and Lampwick climbed aboard, and by dawn of the next day, they had arrived at that much longed for country, the land of toys. It was filled with boys of all ages, and in the streets there was such a racket. Boys were playing marbles and turning somersaults or handsprings, blowing on trumpets and beating on drums, shrieking, howling, and many of them screaming. It wasn't long before Pinocchio became a part of this strange country. For five months, he did nothing but play and eat from morning to night without ever seeing a book or doing any work at all. But one morning when he woke up, he felt two strange, furry, long things on his head. He ran to a mirror and he looked at himself. My ears! They've turned into donkey ears! Indeed. Pinocchio had caught donkey fever. He had turned into a lazy and good-for-nothing donkey. Now he knew he must get out of the land of toys before he would begin to bray like a donkey. One night, when all the other boys and donkeys were asleep, Pinocchio slipped out of bed and dashed through the deserted streets. He ran across the field and the meadow, and he kept on running and running and running. By morning, he came to the seashore. He was quite exhausted and sat down to rest. Then he looked up and saw a group of people standing on the beach with very sad faces. Pinocchio jumped up and ran to them. A kindly fisherman told him that a monstrous whale had come into their peaceful waters and destroyed everything in sight. In fact, he said, many weeks ago, an old man had set out in a small boat sailing across the ocean to look for his lost son, Pinocchio. That's me! And everyone feared for his life. Pinocchio cried out, That's my father! I must save him! I must save him! Boy, don't go out into the ocean! The monster will get you too! Boy, come back! But Pinocchio could not even hear the fisherman. He was swimming so fast, he looked like a black dot on the blue surface of the water. His heart was beating fast, and he was very frightened, but he was determined to find Geppetto. On he swam, farther and farther out to sea. Then, he saw a great white rock, and decided to stop there for a moment and rest. But as he came closer to it, the great white rock began to sway and lunge. And as Pinocchio watched in terror, he saw a huge mouth open, showing three rows of gleaming white teeth, long and pointed. 
It wasn't a rock at all. It was the sea monster. Pinocchio turned quickly and tried to swim away, but the immense mouth was coming closer and closer. Pinocchio swam desperately with all his strength. The whale was upon him, and in a split second, Pinocchio found himself between the rows of gleaming sharp teeth. And then, in another second, he was being washed down into the dark body of the whale without so much as a scratch on him. He lay stunned for a while. Then, as his eyes became accustomed to the darkness of this great cavern, he began to walk around. It seemed to him that he could see a faint light glowing at the far end of the cavern. Pinocchio made his way toward it. It was growing lighter and clearer. And then Pinocchio saw a sight that filled him with such great and sudden happiness he almost dropped in a faint. There stood a small table set for dinner, lighted by a candle stuck in a bottle, and there sat a little old man, white as snow, eating fish for his dinner. Pinocchio said, Father, Father, at last I've found you. Uh, Pinocchio, is it really you? Well, you can imagine the reunion of poor old Geppetto and his puppet son, Pinocchio. They fell into each other's arms, weeping and laughing all at once. Pinocchio told his father all the things that had happened to him, and Geppetto told Pinocchio how his small boat and all his supplies, and he himself, had been swallowed up in one gulp by the sea monster many weeks before, and how he had lived on these meager supplies and live fish, but now his cupboard was empty. Father, we must get out of here. Why can't we not swim out when the whale opens his mouth? Uh, when the monster opens his mouth, everything comes in. Nothing goes out. Father, perhaps if we tickle his throat, we will make him cough us up into the sea. Ah, and then what? I cannot swim, my son. Then I will carry you on my back, and we will swim to the shore. Come, Father, please, let's try it. So Pinocchio and his father, hand in hand, began to walk through the dark cavern toward the monster's throat. Pinocchio took the feather from his cap, and he began to brush it lightly on the sides of the monster's throat. Uh, 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 Pinocchio oh. and Geppetto could see the rows of teeth begin to open, and then... <laughs> With one enormous sneeze, out went Pinocchio and Geppetto past those crushing jaws into the open sea. Geppetto climbed on his son's shoulders, and the brave little puppet began to swim toward the shore. Finally, they struggled up upon the beach. Geppetto lay on the sand, breathing heavily. Pinocchio lay beside him, still and pale, and seeming not to breathe at all. Pinocchio, Pinocchio, my dear little son. Geppetto picked up Pinocchio in his arms, and he began to walk toward the village. When he finally reached his small workshop, he gently laid Pinocchio down on his little bed, and he knelt beside him and prayed. Suddenly, the dark and gloomy room was filled with a shining light, and from out of nowhere, the good fairy appeared. Pinocchio! Pinocchio! Wake up! You have proved yourself obedient, Truthful, unselfish, and brave. Now you are no longer a marionette. You are a real boy. The fairy disappeared. Pinocchio slowly opened his eyes. Oh, they were bright and sparkling. His donkey ears were gone. And his fine little head was covered with real black hair. Pinocchio pinched his arms and legs. Father, look at me. I'm a real live boy. My son, my son. And Geppetto took his real live son in his arms and kissed him joyfully. And from that time on, Pinocchio went to school 
and worked for his father, and so they lived happily ever after.